Another month, another issue of Halo Escalation, and another sad step towards the end of Christopher Schlurf's involvement with the Halo universe. Chris, you will sorely be missed. Issue 5 picks up with Lasky, Petra, and Spartan Ray arriving on the Sangili controlled colony of Karava. It is important to note that this colony is described as Sangili controlled, lying in the middle of contested space, likely referring to the uncertain nature of the galaxy post Covenant. Strangely, though, the description of the comic referred to this as a Sangili Holy Land, though there doesn't seem to be any hint that this place is holy in any regard. Plenty of other Covenant species are seen wandering about. Oh, oh my god, dear. It is that supposed to be an ungoy? The hell is wrong with its mouth? Where the hell is its methane pack? Why the hell are those Kigar simulators as tall as a Sangeli? Okay, okay, I, I, I know, I know I keep ragging on the art of this series, but as an art major, I can't abide it. In a later panel, once again, methane packless grunt looks much taller than it should be, while a human looks almost as tall as a nearby Sangeli. And what the hell is up with this pointless panel? Okay. Okay. Let's move on. The group is on Karava to meet a Sangheili known as Zef Tral, a source Petra has used before. As they make their way to the meetup point in Kor Delban, Spartan Ray has a close encounter with the Sangheili, though Petra tells Ray to basically brush it off. And while this scene is horribly drawn, I mean, seriously, what the hell is up with that face? We do learn some interesting information. When the Sangheili starts to growl at Ray, she suggests growling back. Petra advises against this, saying that imitating the Sangili language is considered an insult. This info could be considered intuitive, who likes to have someone make fun of their native language, but it was, in my opinion, interesting nonetheless. It is also worth pointing out that all the Covenant species seem to be wearing nothing but armor. Humans are the only species seen dressing casually. However, seeing as this planet is in the middle of contested space, I can see why some species may feel the need to be armored up at all times. Still, I personally would have preferred it if more species had their street clothes on. Maybe that's just me. Anyway, so this Sangili, named Lordan, along with a few of his buddies, decides to attack Ray and the gang since Ray apparently pissed him off. Maybe it's the pointless booty shot, or maybe I'm just projecting. Petra pulls out a revolver with some beautiful designs on it, and kills Lordan, and scares off the others. As they continue to make their way towards Kor Delban, Petra notes that the survivors now think that Lasky and Ray are her pets. I love little tidbits like this. Petra and gang finally get to a small canteen, and while the previously mentioned pointless panel annoys the hell out of me, I love the imagery of a human serving Sangheili drinks. And most of all, a drunk Sangheili. Seriously, he's almost passed out drunk. I mean, he even pukes in a later panel. It's the small details like this that make me love this comic series. As Lasky sits down, Zeph proves right away that he is worth the money that Petra pays him, showing that he already knows who Lasky is and why he's there. One of the things I love right off the bat about Zeph is he's wearing black aesthetic armor. If that means he was part of the ascetics, a highly elite group of elites, or just took the armor at some point is unknown, but I'd like to imagine the former. Also, it's always nice to see these extra variants that we haven't really seen in a while. Anyway, before Zeph gets to the point, he briefly talks about the idea of a Jiro Hane Sangheili alliance, or rather a non-aggression agreement, calling the idea quote-unquote crazy talk. Now, I have berated the idea of aliens using human sayings, especially when it comes to their constant use throughout the Kilo 5 books and Mortal Vatata in particular. Maybe I'm being biased, but this particular instance felt a lot more natural than anything Immortal Dictata did. Moving forward, Zeph shares what he knows about Vada Gajat and who leaked the location of this Sangili Jirohane peace talks. He says that Vada was formally employed by Jewel and Dama, so I can't help but wonder if Jewel knows that Vada is no longer working for him, and was a proud member of the Covenant before that. Lasky asks, He's no longer Covenant? And I, I just, I love Zeph's response here. What does it mean to be Covenant today? A hundred warlords claim they rule the Covenant, but each of them leads only a small faction. This beautifully sums up the fallout of the collapse of the Covenant Empire. I hate to circle back to Kilo 5, but it's sad that, in my opinion, a single line better depicts the galaxy in disarray than an entire book series did. Again, I'm probably being biased, but I like to think I can stay objective. I don't know, you guys tell me. So, let's get on to the big reveal of the issue, the traitor in the UNSC's midst. That human that we saw with Gajat back in issue 2, his name is revealed to be Captain Daniel Clayton. Clayton serves under Admiral Horatio Temkin, the UNSC ambassador to Sangelios, and the one who arranged the meeting, explaining how Clayton knew where the meeting would be. Lasky's story in this issue comes to a close with a twist that would make M. Night Shyamalan proud. Clayton is James Cutter's son. Dun dun dun! 
Back in Infinity, Roland is able to find the origin of the ship that attacked Infinity, and Hood reveals why he is the reason the Spirit of Fire went missing. As it turns out, Hood was once James Cutter's XO, and Cutter gave Hood his first ship, the Roman Blue. During the First Battle of Arcadia in 2531, as the Spirit of Fire was chasing Covenant forces out system, Roman Blue was ordered to recover a log buoy dropped by the ship before jumping to slip space. However, Hood, young and angry, decided to take on the remaining Covenant forces. As expected though, the UNSC was no match for the Covenant, and basically because of Hood's rashness, the Spirit of Fire's location was lost. So the time comes to decide on whether or not to follow up on the coordinates Roland found. The coordinates point to Oath Lodan, a gas giant deep in Jirohanic territory and only one system away from their home planet of Doziak. If the Infinity were to get caught in that system, it would be a diplomatic nightmare. However, with Palwer's assurance that her Spartans could sneak in without trouble, Hood approves a scouting mission. Using booster frames, nice to see those back, Palmer and Majestic sneak into the system through an asteroid field. However, what they find is not the Spirit of Fire, but a Covenant space station. Worse, and unknown to the Spartans, Vata is aware of their presence. We cut to aboard the space station and whoa! Clayton looks plain sinister in this panel. Anyway, Clayton starts talking to Vata about James Cutter, noting how Cutter took care of Clayton and his mom, as in not Cutter's wife. Remember, prior to this, the only kid that we knew that Cutter had was a daughter, and how his family was taken care of even after Cutter's disappearance. As Vata grows frustrated with Clayton's inaction, he reveals he's been waiting for the Infinity to show up and opens a communications channel. He reveals himself to Lord Hood and berates the Admiral for his failure to recover the log buoy and reveals that Hood had been taking care of Clayton his whole life. Hell, Clayton believes his entire military career is due to nepotism, and he probably ain't far off. Clayton further reveals that he's been working with the elusive Admiral Drake, glad to finally hear from this guy again, before using the space station's glassing beam to blast a hole through Infinity. Now, I do find this scene a little odd, but this is a proper glassing beam, not ship-to-ship -ship weaponry, and the former would be much stronger than the latter. So, that about wraps up issue 5. It was a hell of an issue, and has only left me begging for more. I'm sad that we didn't get to see the Spirit of Fire directly, but the next issue promises to, quote, bring the saga of Halo Wars into the modern era, hopefully meaning a proper appearance by the Spirit of Fire and her crew. Let's close this episode with a look towards the future. The description and art for issue 8 recently released, and boy did I call it! While nothing is concrete, we may get a cameo from the Chief himself in the coming issues. The Chief is returning in a big way. The Master Chief returns in the next 72 hours, part 1. After defeating the Didact, John 117 joined the crew of Infinity. But why did he leave? The mystery begins here. Halo lead writer Brian Reed, Amazing Spider-Man, Ms. Marvel, reveals the secret events that immediately follow the end of Halo 4. I really can't wait for July, and I can't help but feel the fact that this issue is releasing after E3 is significant. Well, that's it for today, Spartans. This has been Halo Cannon. I'll see you next time.